Welcome back. At this point, we now refer uh, ourselves to um, the tyrant Pisistratus of Athens, uh, who ruled from 546 to 527 BC, eventually dying of natural causes in 527 BC. And as we explained before, his official position is tyrant, meaning that he had um, uh, successfully uh, replaced um, the uh, pre-existing Athenian government with his own rule, but not necessarily in a manner that would be adverse uh, for the people he would be ruling. Now, um, the history of Pisistratus is a rather curious one because he actually had attempted to be tyrant um, prior to 546 BC. He had tried as far back as 560 BC. One of the um, areas of inequity, we've been talking about this in relation to wealth um, in the Athenian and Attic um, countryside, had to do with the location where uh, somebody uh, might live in relation to Athens. Now, the Athenian city itself was relatively close to two uh, ports um, that would uh, lead out into the, um, uh, the Bay of uh, Salamis that would then go further out into the Aegean Sea. Um, those two ports were the more famous Piraeus Harbor and also another one a little bit to the east of the Piraeus called the Phaleron. Now, that meant that anybody who lived either in Athens itself or somewhere along the coastline, if you could sort of think of beachfront property, that type of thing, uh, would be living in a fairly um, uh, distinguished area because they would live relatively close to the ports. Whereas anybody who was further north of Athens, uh, living in the plain of Attica itself, the territory, would be somewhat further back away from Athens, but still possibly well enough off. And then if you go even further away, you go, go uh, along the northern coast um, of uh, the Gulf of uh, the um, uh, Sunian Spit, go all the way up uh, and towards Boeotia, you'll eventually come into a much more ru rugged mountainous area. And those are the people of Attica who would have lived the furthest away from Athens and would have had the least opportunity uh, to um, interact with city Athenians and be informed about what was going on in Athens itself and probably may, may possibly have been um, the lowest educated um, of the group. So essentially you've got three groups of people. You have coast, plain, and highlands. If you th think of, of, of some modern countries today where there are, there are those kinds of differentiations, this is kind of what this is like. So um, Pisistratus was a, a political figure in Athens who uh, realized uh, in the 560s BC that um, of these three groups that we're talking about, these um, that uh, there were three factions forming of politicians uh, representing coast, plain, and highlands. He realized that if he could represent the highlands, he would have a very good chance of presenting himself as the champion of the disaffected. So he managed to um, get himself installed as tyrant in 560 BC for a very short time, but then his political enemies ousted him. Thereafter, he found this very tall woman, dressed her up in very regal robes, brought her on a very tall um, carriage uh, back to um, the city of Athens and stood outside the wall with this woman on a, on a cart and said to the Athenians, this is Athena. She uh, demands that you admit him and make him your ruler. The Athenians, seeing this very powerful looking woman, uh, believed him, put him in power. He lasted uh, again in 560 BC for a few months until eventually the trick he pulled on the Athenians was found out and he was ousted again. This time he was in exile for 14 years. However, in 546 BC, he finally combined with uh, some of his uh, um, former enemies and he was able eventually to get himself back installed in, in power in 546 BC and, and finally uh, his power stuck. I should also point out that the family of the Pisistratids was uh, a rival family for that family of Alchemianids. And uh, since I have space here now, I will show you the way to spell Alchemianid. There is Alchemianid. And again, Alchemianid is the family that is implicated with that Agos we talked about before regarding Cylon. Uh, Cylon, again, was the um, would-be tyrant who tried to take over the um, uh, Athenian necropolis and the government. 
and um, he was uh, promised uh, safe passage off the Acropolis and was denied that and was actually executed by the Alcmeonid family. So this, this family of Pisichetids and the Alcmeonids are rival families uh, in ruling Athens. All right, so Pisichetids finally was able to get himself established as tyrant uh, in 546 BC. And he um, did quite a bit to uh, rebuild the city of Athens, which had fallen uh, in decay. Uh, due to some of the um, previous um, periods of unrest uh, occurring in Athens. And uh, he rebuilt it. And uh, he also purified uh, with a religious delegation the island of Delos, this very small island out in the Aegean Sea that you can find on your map. Interestingly, on your uh, yellow and blue map, uh, you'll notice that in the middle of the Aegean Sea, there's a place where it says Delos, but the only thing you see there is a black dot. The island of Delos is um, a square mile. It's like the city of uh, Central Falls uh, in, uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, it's, it, on that map, it's, it's located under the dot. So Delos, um, despite its very small size, turned out to be a both religiously and politically very important place. Uh, we'll speak more about its political implications uh, in later videos. But for right now, uh, Pisichetus basically uh, got hold of Delos as an Athenian property by purifying the island. There was actually no um, uh, polis there. Instead, this was a place where the shrines of Apollo, Artemis, and the other gods were located because in mythology, this is where uh, the gods Apollo and Artemis were said to have been born um, from their, their mother Leto. So uh, Delos uh, receiving this purification um, was also upgraded uh, to, to have a, a full uh, a set of uh, shrines and uh, became, as I said, an essentially an extension of um, Athenian territory. So that would turn out to have major implications for the way the Athenians would conduct uh, their government and business uh, in the 5th century BC. Our, the, the, the main reason why Pisichetus is relevant for this course on tragedy, the main reason why I've been um, uh, giving some of this uh, historical background for Athens, is that Pisichetus was a major sponsor of the arts, including, for the purpose of this class, the dramatic arts. Uh, the Athenians claimed that it was under his tyranny that a man named Thespis, and now that we're talking about tragedy, we're going to the darkness. Thespis had uh, performed the very first Athenian um, tragedy, uh, as we discussed in a, in a prior video, involving a single actor uh, portraying the um, god Dionysus and then a chorus of, of followers of Dionysus around him singing the Dithyram Chorus. Um, scholars do not necessarily believe that um, that's in fact the case, even though that, that, that was a very popular story uh, that the Athenians told about the birth of tragedy. Um, there were other uh, competitors for that role, including the Megarians, who claimed that uh, their um, poet Arion, A-R-I-O-N, was the one who formed tragedy, so we can't be sure. But um, under Pisichetus, uh, it does seem pretty clear that uh, the arts took hold and became a major uh, part of Athenian intellectual life and, in time, uh, political life as well. So you need to uh, know a little bit about this figure um, in history to understand uh, one of the sources for a tragedy as you are reading it in this course. Uh, next, um, uh, we're going to move after Pisichetus uh, to uh, the successors, uh, his two sons, Hippias and Hipparchus. And although they started off okay, uh, things went suddenly rapidly downhill for them. And uh, quite a bit uh, happened to, to uh, change itself around in Athenian government. And it's in that period of uh, upheaval that this other fellow, Cleisthenes, is going to emerge on the scene. See you next video.